everyone that we are recording this event. Please stay on mute. You may type in questions using the chat box and we'll address these during or at the end of the presentation. We may also open the floor at the end so that you can unmute your mic and ask your questions then. And now for our speaker, Dr. Tom Webb is a vascular surgeon at the Franciscan Health Heart Center where um, he is medical director of vascular services. Dr. Webb earned his medical degree from the Medical College of Virginia. He completed his residency in general surgery at the Johns Hopkins Hospital and his fellowship in vascular surgery at the University of Chicago. Dr. Webb is board certified in general and vascular surgery with special expertise in aortic aneurysm, carotid endarterectomy, lower extremity arterial revascularization, dialysis access, and varicose veins. Dr. Webb has over 30 years of experience in vascular medicine. So thank you. I will let you take it over and I will turn off my camera. All right. Thanks, Dawn. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for the privilege of the floor. Uh, I'm going to cover a gamut of diseases tonight uh, pretty quickly. I'd be happy to answer questions along the way or afterwards, but here's the list. Hopefully everybody can see. Uh, I think the most important is the aortic dissection, intramural hematoma, penetrating aortic ulcer, traumatic aortic tear, aortic aneurysm, aortitis, and finally just a minute or two on aortic occlusive disease. So the first, uh, I think everybody is probably aware of this, aortic dissection is actually the most common cause of aortic emergency or catastrophe in the U.S. And the misdiagnosis still haunts us today, and there's been a lot of publicity about this in the public sector. And it's hit the front page of the Wall Street Journal here in 2003. I actually was uh, working in Nebraska at the time. This hit the front page, I believe, one of the main editors of the Wall Street Journal's uh, father died from a dissection that was undiagnosed. And this is typical of what we saw. It was a 19-year-old kid who had a strong family history of aneurysm, probably had Marfan's history, and he came into the emergency room with chest pain at age 19. And the family uh, talked to the ED doctor at nauseam and said, we have a strong family history of aneurysm, yada, yada, yada. And they refused to do any imaging, and he succumbed from his dissection. He had an ascending aortic dissection and died uh, within 24 hours from misdiagnosis. So just this had a lot of play in uh, the Wall Street Journal, obviously, a uh, big circulation in the U.S. And here, here's a few of the most prominent uh, actors that have died from aortic dissection. Uh, Lucille Ball at age 77. I think we all remember John Ritter at age 54 may not know, Jonathan Larson was the playwright for Rent, and he never got to see his show in action. The night before, or two nights before, he ended up in a couple of the emergency rooms in New York City, and he had severe chest pain, and they had some abnormalities, but they failed to recognize it. One of the keys was his pulse pressure was widened. He still had undiagnosed chest pain, and they, he kind of roamed around the city, different emergency departments and died uh, the day before his play was to start on Broadway. So really a sad story. And it, this was one of the first times, I think, in America that the emergency rooms, the two emergency rooms were fined for misdiagnosis. And it wasn't a huge fine. It was like fifteen to $60,000. But it was one of the first times that emergency departments were actually sued for misdiagnosis. And then finally, Bill Paxton, I think, in 2017, also died from complications of uh, aortic dissection. And probably the most famous death from aortic dissection is actually the grandfather of the diagnosis and treatment, and it's Michael DeBakey. I think everybody's familiar with uh, Dr. DeBakey. He is considered the foremost authority on vascular disease. He was probably the first, it's debatable, but we believe he was the first to perform a carotid endarterectomy in the world. He was certainly the first to fix an open thoracic aneurysm. And he was also very intrigued by aortic dissection. As you'll see, he came up with a grading system for dissection and actually designed um, the procedure uh, to repair an aortic dissection. But here's the crazy thing. I, I would uh, say, take a second to read this. It's on the internet and it's about Dr. DeBakey's last days. And it's the man on the table device, the surgery. There's two articles and they appear in the New York Times. And the interesting thing was Dr. DeBakey at age 97 was sitting home over the holidays. It was December 31st and he had rip roaring chest pain. And he was probably the most brilliant 
cardiovascular surgeon that uh, I've met or that uh, was was in his time. And he uh, very astutely made the diagnosis at age 97. He says, I'm either having a heart attack or I have an aortic dissection and I don't want anything done. And he actually had a directive, a DNR, and he had advanced directive that said, I do not want surgery irregardless. I'm 97, I'm done, let me go. So long story short, he didn't seek medical attention. He actually sat at home over the holidays and it didn't get better. So a few days later, his colleagues were worried because they didn't see him. He still went to the hospital every day and they called him. He said, I'm having this terrible chest pain. He said, well, Dr. DeVake, you need to come in and get a scan or get an EKG. And he says, no, because I don't want anything done. So he actually gave a talk January 6th. So seven days into this, he went and gave a talk and two of his colleagues were standing next to him to support him in case he fell during his talk. He gave a, a talk, Grand Rounds, I believe it was, and then went home. And then he kind of declined over the next uh, three or four weeks. So I think it was end of January, his dissection progressed. He was still having chest pain. He had an advanced directive and uh, his staff was obviously uh, miserable. They, they wanted to help him, but he didn't want help. So he finally got to the point where he went into renal failure and azotemia and actually had metal untumdation. And then things got kind of crazy. His wife, who was younger, sought help from a healer in Europe, which is essentially a palm reader. And she told her that he needs to have surgery. He'll survive. Please do surgery. So she came back. So now he's obtunded in the hospital. This is February, some six or eight weeks into the course. And they decide that they're going to operate on him against his wishes. And this is a ethics committee meets. None of his anesthesiologists at uh, a Baylor Methodist will actually touch him. So he had they had to recruit an anesthesiologist from cross town at the VA to come put him to sleep. And he had surgery to fix his ascending aortic dissection at age 97, which is amazing. So long story short, next 10 months of his life, he stayed in uh, ICU. He had a feeding tube, G tube. He was vent, he had a trach, he was on dialysis and actually survived all this and lasted till age 99. So really uh, just a crazy story about end of life directives and how they just got misconstrued at the end for probably the greatest cardiovascular surgeon in the world. <clears throat> it's quite common, it's 2.6 to 3.5 out of 100,000. Uh, usually it's a 60 to 80 year old uh, male Mean age is 63 uh, for male, a little older in females, uh, age 67 or uh, 67. So as you know, um, a dissection is actually a tear in the enema and a degeneration in the media. So we think it's kind of a combination of a diseased aorta, atherosclerosis with medial degeneration, probably a blip in blood pressure, and then we're off to the races. The blood jet gets in between the layers of the media, as you can see here, and dissects the enema and a layer of the media off the adventitia and blood flows in this now what we call the false lumen. And the flow, uh, the, the, the uh, porosity of flow is actually uh, predicted by the re-entry tear. If there's a big re-entry tear, flow will normalize and the septum will kind of uh, drift to the midline. And you'll have two, two lumens, a true and a false lumen. The true is the actual true enema and the false lumen is that is that one that's dissected uh, dissected between the tunica media and adventitia. Here's DeBakey's classification system. He was the first uh, to classify the types of aortic dissection. Type one involves the ascending and goes into the descending. Type two is ascending alone, and type three A is the descending above the diaphragm. Type three B is below the diaphragm, and Believe it or not, these uh, it's a lot easier. Most people uh, use the Stanford system. Type A is ascending, A for ascending, and type B is descending. That's the simplest. So DeBakey type one and two are in type A. DeBakey type three is uh, a Stanford type uh, B. So here's the associated conditions. It's all walks of life pretty much. Hypertension is present in 70% of uh, type B, 36% of type A. I think we all know the genetically mediated uh, risk factors, Marfan's, Ehlers-Danlos, Losteets, pre-existing aneurysm, a previous dissection variant. We'll talk about this in detail. That's the intramural hematoma. Bicuspid aortic valve increases the risk. A obviously, aortic instrumentation, 
one of my good friends uh, actually was getting a coronary cath, and I believe they scraped the enema and ended up with a fairly extensive dissection requiring a surgery. So it does happen. It's not very common, but does. Aortic coarctation, a familial history of thoracic aneurysm, trauma, we'll spend a second on that. Uh, the other is third trimester of pregnancy, just the uh, force of delivery and labor sometimes leads to dissection, which is usually catastrophic. Uh, inflammatory disease such as giant cell arteritis, tachyases arteritis, rheumatoid arthritis, and syphilis, uh, Turner syndrome, and uh, I think we all know now the fluoroquinolone uh, ciprofloxin or equivalent uh, increases your risk of aortic dissection, and uh, it's been tabled for the most part for antibiotic use. Uh, and I think uh, cocaine and methamphetamine, obviously, if you, jock your blood, if you jack your blood pressure up, you certainly could tear the enema and uh, uh, propagate a dissection. <clears throat> uh, pain is present in 90%. That's the tip off. Typically, it's more substernal in a type A because that involves the ascending aorta and typically interscapular uh, chest pain if it's a type B just because it's involving the descending thoracic aorta. And you can see uh, hypertension, uh, much more common with type B, 70%, only in 36% of type A. And hypotension, very rare in type B, but uh, actually uh, a quarter of patients with type A. And there's a reason for that, as we'll show you. Malperfusion can occur in 20 to 30 percent. This includes in the ascending to the coronary artery, which obviously would re result in pump failure, aortic insufficiency or uh, uh, breach of the annulus, and then finally cardiac tamponade. Those all can lead to hypotension, which is unique for a type A dissection. Again, malperfusion in 20 to 30 percent, a brain uh, stroke, 7 to 14, mesenteric, uh, 3.7 percent, and lower extremity limb or upper extremity, 9.1 percent. And if you look over here to the right, you can see all the various uh, type of uh, uh, disability you can have from aortic dissection, including aortic insufficiency and heart failure, myocardial infarction from compromise of the coronary artery, osteum from the dissection process, cardiac tamponade, uh, hemothorax from rupture, corner syndrome, not very common, stroke and syncope if you dissect up into the carotid or nominate or even the vertebral system, uh, upper extremity or lower extremity pulselessness, paraplegia, and that's typically from picking off one of the intercostal arteries uh, that's supplying the spinal cord, back or flank, uh, renal failure, mesenteric ischemia, and a lower extremity pain. I think one of uh, these come in all walks. I think uh, just to give you an example, lower extremity had a 36-year-old was teeing off, I think, in March on the first hole and kind of felt this pain and uh, hurt a rip. And he actually dissected his aorta and he actually presented with a lower extremity pain and weakness. And for about 48 hours, they thought it was obviously swinging a golf club too hard. They thought it was a lumbar disc or something. And finally, somebody examined his legs and felt his pulses were diminished and actually had fairly extensive uh, type A dissection that was uh, misdiagnosed for about 48 hours. So they can present in all sorts of crazy ways. The key thing is malperfusion. This is the tricky part. Uh, it's all based on entry, re-entry tears. And I think you can see there's up top here, there's a static obstruction. And this is the true lumen here. And this is the false lumen, and the pressure is too high in the false lumen, and actually push the true lumen septum over, and it can obstruct. Let's say this is the renal artery; it can obstruct the origin and cause uh, that kidney to infarct. The dynamic. This is the hardest one to diagnose, and I'll show you an example of this. Again, uh, remember this is not. Uh, this is a dynamic process. There's systole and diastole. So just look at this membrane here. Let's say the true. This is the false channel. There's high pressure in the false, less than the true. Each heartbeat, this septum is going to bounce back and forth. And so you'll have intermittent obstruction and flow. And that can, uh, the tip off is sometimes if it's like the renal artery, you're having intermittent uh, uh, bouts of uh, severe hypertension and then inter uh, intermingled with hypotension. And then you can, of course, have both static and dynamic, which is uh, the true lumens compromise and giving some flow. And there's also a, a static component from thrombus formation from the actual dissection flap. So this is the tricky part. You really have to stay on your toes when these patients come in to kind of determine uh, kind of what's going on. So here's the CT. This is representative. Here's the right kidney over here, liver here, 
left kidney, and I think you can see the aorta here. Very easy to see the membrane. So this is actually the true lumen here, and this is the false. And the first thing you can see is there's a contrast differential. There's obviously more in the true than the false. You can see the true lumen's tapered off here. So this is probably malperfusions to the kidney because you can see the contrast load here is much different than the right side. So this is probably both a static and dynamic sort of uh, renal artery stenosis equivalent here in an acute dissection. So diagnostic imaging, uh, transthoracic echo, um, not so bad, uh, not great. TE, more sensitive. Uh, obviously, uh, state of the art is to get a CT angiography. So you really have to think about this. So a chest pain that's unexplained uh, by EKG or a cardiac issue, obviously a uh, high uh, th uh, uh, indication for CT angio or equivalent to not only rule out dissection, but also pulmonary embolus. MRI and MRA is not too practical just because it takes much longer. Instead of a breath hold for CT angio, it's uh, 30 or 40 minutes for the MRI. So that's kind of fallen out of his favor. Uh, let's talk uh, first about the Stanford type A or the ascending. Uh, here's a shot, uh, coronary cusp here. The typical dissection occurs in the non-coronary cusp, and 90% of the time this dissection will go on the greater curvature of the aortic arch and also dissect on the left lateral wall of the descending thoracic aorta. Usually picks off the left renal artery and the celiac superior mesenteric artery and right renal typically come off the true lumen. And that happens 90% of the time. There's 1% mortality per hour. So this is the huge take home message. The clock's ticking. So when this patient gets to the ED, their survival is dictated by how quickly they can be surgically repaired. So emergent repair is necessary. Cannulation sites sometimes challenging. Uh, part of the issue is, is the coronary valve involved? Can we resuspend it? Do we have to replace it? Is the coronary ostium involved? Do we have to reimplant that or tack that up? Uh, if the arch is involved, sometimes you need uh, hy hypothermic circulatory arrest. Uh, and here's an interesting fact. And if you look at all the data that's accumulated over the last several decades, if you successfully repair the ascending and arch and suspend the true lumen, distal malperfusion corrects about 92 to 96 percent of the time. So those are pretty good odds, but you still have to have a, a high suspicion for dissection if patients aren't behaving correctly. One of the tip-offs, if they have bad lactic acidosis uh, and they're finishing up their pump run, then uh, high suspicion for mesenteric compromise and probably need to be imaged. So there's a bunch of techniques not to get uh, too far advanced. One of the slick ones to help when the uh, dissection and aneurysmal change goes not only from the ascending but out into the proximal descending. This is one of the more challenging. Uh, just for the non-surgeons, uh, median sternotomy, you can see about this far over. So you can see the ascending and nominant, left carotid and uh, subclavian sometimes a stretch, but the descending thoracic aorta is in the left chest cavity. So it's impossible to see from the median sternotomy. So you, to repair the ascending in type A, you have to have the median sternotomy. Um, and so one of the tricks you can do to come back and fix the descending, knowing that it's dilated, is actually drop an elephant trunk in, which is depicted over here to the right. And this is a graph that's kind of sewn at the end of the arch and telescopes into the proximal descending thoracic aorta. So here's a gate now that you can either sew to with open repair by incising the aorta here and putting a clamp on, or you can actually drive a stent graft up here at a later date. So this is typical of the uh, elephant trunk or repair of the ascending when the descending's involved. And here's a pretty, this is the frozen elephant trunk here. One of the variations is instead of sewing the elephant trunk in, you can actually get a stent graft. This is an aortic stent graft and you can actually put it in through a sidearm of your new graft in the ascending and deploy it and that can expand and fill the aorta, and you can actually sew the distal end of this graft to it. So this is the so-called frozen elephant trunk. So you have hypothermic circulatory rest. All flow is turned off to the descending thoracic aorta. You put the graft in, deploy it, and then you sew the end of the graft to it, and then you're on your way. And then this is uh, really spectacular. This is, uh, I think, Japan has an edge on us here. This is a total... Uh, 
uh, almost percutaneous, just neck incision. This is the patient over here to the left. You can see uh, uh, one, two neck incisions, and there's a groin puncture. And this is an endovascular stent graft repair of uh, a type A dissection, which is a crazy. So you double poke the innominant to get anti-grade retrograde access. Uh, same with the common carotid. Also in the left subclavian, you have a 12 French sheath and you drive up. And here's the stent graft deployed in the ascending. It's taken down. If you look here, it's just above the left coronary artery. And then uh, you have to attach grafts to it. So we're gonna, the trick is you have a laser probe, you come in the native innominant, left common, and left subclavian artery, and you burn a hole into the graft. And then you put additional stent graft, which is a stent covered with impervious graft in, and you can dock into the main body. So here's complete repair of a type A dissection, almost percutase, small neck incisions, and uh, the patient uh, is saved with this procedure. Pretty amazing. So that is uh, part of the future, I think, uh, moving forward. Here's an example of laser penetration. It's just a laser probe. Here's a glass tube model. You just put it in the native artery, put a little pressure against the graft, and it burns a hole right through the graft. So you can put a wire through it. Here's a wire through it, dilate it, and put another graft to kind of seal it and dock in with the branch vessel. Pretty slick technique, but that is the future. <clears throat> Again, uh, just to summarize, this is a surgical emergency, urgent CV uh, surgery consultation, open repair. For now, it's the best intervention. I think the endograft will be on its way down the road. Uh, select endovascular repair and very select patients and kind of malperfusion dictates overall mortality. So with malperfusion, it can be as high as 18 to 26% with open repair. Let's switch gears, Stanford type B, um, it involves the descending thoracic aorta, so it does involve the ascending. So the malperfusion syndrome potentially is different. It's not all the aortic regurgitation, tamponade, and brain issues or uh, cerebral ischemia, it's spinal cord, liver, bowel, kidneys, legs for the most part, because these are the branch points obviously off the lower aorta. Um, in the absence of malperfusion or rupture, medical management is the uh, uh, procedure of choice. Uh, obviously, paramount is beta blockade, and for the most part, that's esmolol intravenously. I would warn you, um, esmolol is mixed with D5W. So if you're hammering the patient with max dose esmolol within 24 hours, you're going to get a pretty significant hyponatremia. So you need to shift gears pretty quickly at 12 to 18 hours. You really have to make a decision. Are we going to go to IV intermittent metoprolol or equivalent oral? but we need to get them off the esmolol pretty quickly to avoid this hyponatremia. Alpha blockade's important not for uh, this straightforward type B from hypertension and degeneration of the media, but in the cocaine and methamphetamine patients, they deserve to be on both esmolol and alpha blockade. And our goal here is to decrease the change in pressure over time. And that's what the beta blocker does uh, most effectively. So again, the tear is distal to the left subclavian in the Stanford type B or to Bakey type three. There's variable re-entry sites, and that's the trick is kind of learning to read where the entry site is and where the re-entry is. And again, you can get spinal mesenteric renal or lower extremity malperfusion. Indications for early surgical intervention, uh, obviously rupture uh, into the thorax, uncontrollable hypertension. We'll talk about that in a second with a patient example. Visceral or limb ischemia, this dissection extension despite medical management, acute proximal descending thoracic aorta diameter of four centimeters or greater. Uh, keep in mind, usually with the dissection in the descending thoracic aorta, the most likely site for aneurysmal change is in the proximal portion. I think, as you remember back in the uh, anatomy days, there's more elastin in the thoracic aorta and proximally and less as you move distally, and there's more collagen as you move distally in the aorta. So that dictates that it's going to be that proximal descending thoracic aorta that's going to dilate over time from the initial dissection. Here's an example. We just had this patient in a few weeks ago, a 37-year-old. She had Marfan. She'd already had her ascending uh, aorta repaired, an aortic valve repaired, and part of her arch. And she came in with an acute type B equivalent. And not to belabor the point, but she gave us a fit. She ended up on five different drugs uh, for hypertension and the ace in the hole for me is minoxidil. Obviously, if I'm giving minoxidil to a female, it's got to be a dire. 
And uh, what happened is so she's on this huge uh, uh, hypertension kick. It was really hard to control her. And the, I think the reason here, if you look at her aorta here in the descending thoracic aorta, this is the true lumen that lights up. This is the false lumen over here. I think you can see that. So that's when she was first admitted. And now with increasing difficulties with pressure, we rescanned her about four days later. And look what's happened. The true lumen over here, see this little crescent? It's almost nothing. So her false channel probably has a small reentry tear. So the pressure is higher there. There's less flow of contrast through it clearly because the contrast is different here. And it's actually compression, her true lumen. And the true lumen was what was supplying her celiac, mesenteric, and renal arteries. So we tried to coax this lady into stain and get it fixed, but she was adamant to get out of here. Um, so uh, hopefully she'll return so we can fix that. But that was this was probably dynamic obstruction of her true lumen feeding her renal vessels as a result of a mismatch in the uh, entry and re-entry tear here with more pressure in the false channel. And this can be worsened with blood pressure control, believe it or not. If you change the blood pressure differential, you can get this septum moving one way or another. So you have to be on your toes to pick this up. And here's, uh, I think, my uh, favorite story of all time. This is a fellow, he was 48, he's an electrician in town. He was doing a little crystal met and found, uh, felt a little chest pain and ended up at Community South and they misdiagnosed him. I think they said he had reflux, but anyway, he wasn't feeling so well, did a little bit, little bit more crystal met and finally arrived at our ED. And uh, this was his original CT scan. You can see pretty complex dissection. Here's his membrane here. He's got a little thromus, it looks like there, and his uh, diameter in the proximal descending thoracic aorta meets repair uh, criteria. It's over four centimeters. 4.8 and um, the problem with this guy is I got a call I think I checked him in put art line central line in checked him into the ICU then I got a call at 2 a.m. and said my patient was gone and uh, the patient escaped from the locked ICU and uh, they found his IV his art line and his central line sitting in the bathroom and his uh, <laughs> so they called the guy and they said what where the heck are you he said I'm out in the parking lot so he, he couldn't get enough of crystal met so uh, they said, well, you got need to come back in. So he came back in, and he, he probably had the worst DTs of any patient I've ever taken care of in my career. And it took us 10 days. He was paralyzed. He was on everything known to mankind. He was, uh, I think, on about 50 of Ativan a day. And he finally turned the corner 10 days out so I could fix him. And uh, we fixed him with the endovascular repair. Uh, <clears throat> The state, of, uh, in 2013, believe it or not, they actually approved stent graft repairs for acute dissections, type B dissections. And the crazy thing is they actually uh, approved it but didn't have indications for it use. So they said uh, it's okay to use, but we can't tell you who to put it in. So we had to come up as a SVS, we had to kind of come up with criteria and kind of uh, uh, predict and uh, kind of pick out who was going to uh, – improve from stent graft versus uh, medical management versus open repair. So I'll just say um, the dissection area is key. We can we need a place to deploy the graft where there's good apposition. And you can see the subclavian carotid. We can move over with bypasses from the carotid to carotid or carotid subclavian. So we can move the seal zone over to get seals on most patients who have a type B dissection. Because usually the dilatation occurs over beyond the left subclavian artery. <clears throat> so since the approval in 2013, there's a larger percentage of early surgical therapy. And for the most part, this is what we call TVAR or thoracic endovascular repair. There's uh, now 53% are being treated surgically versus 25% before the FDA approval. And the sad thing is there's really no appreciable change in mortality when comparing medical versus surgical therapy. So uh, you have to choose TVAR and open repair wisely. For the most, the moral majority, it's medical management. Uh, I'm going to shift gears, the intramural hematoma, and this is a little different beast. This is the dissection equivalent. So there's a breach in the enema and media. Uh, there's no reentry distally in, back into the true lumen, so the false lumen actually thrombosis. So this is more common uh, beyond the subclavian. It does occur, occur in the arch and ascending, but much, much more common around the corner and beyond the left subclavian artery takeoff. There's less likelihood of malperfusion, and typically we treat it medically. 
on occasion type A's we uh, operate on. And here's the deal. You get a tear in the adventitia and blood gets into the, between the, or not the adventitia, but the enema. Blood gets in the layer in the media. And I think you can see here the appearance on CT. This is the normal appearance. And you can see there's a thickening, circumferential thickening around the aortic contrast. And that's typical of intramural hematoma. So different from a dissection because there's no reentry, so there's no flow in the false lumen. It's actually just thrombus, and it can be quite subtle on CT. I think you can see this little crescent on non-contrast, and this is the typical appearance on a contrast CT over to the right ear. And this is a patient we had, I think, uh, earlier in the springtime. It was a 89-year-old um, former uh, ICU nurse. And she came in with a hypertension, 210 over 100. She had typical a chest pain, interscapular pain. And this was her original scan over here to the left. And I think you can see there's a little crescent of hyperlucent thromus here. And that was the tip off. So we actually did a contrast CT. And she has a typical appearance of an intramural hematoma. And if you look back on her CT, there's actually a little tear right here at the top of her proximal descending thoracic aorta. So kind of misdiagnosis for a few days, got her on a beta blocker, got out of the hospital, and she came back, and all that was pretty much healed. And that's typical of the intramural hematoma. Treated medically, most 99% will heal and will not be an issue as far as aneurysmal change or malperfusion. We'll shift uh, one more time. A penetrating aortic ulcer, uh, this is a breach in the enema. It's denuded. You get flow outside the lumen here, and it's held intact by the adventitia, but it's a bleb essentially within the tunica media or the muscle layer of the aorta. It's typically associated with atherosclerosis, can lead to dissection, can lead to intramural hematoma or even rupture. And uh, here's a typical CT appearance of this equivalent. You see over to the right, I think you can see that bleb here. And here's a patient we took care of uh, recently. Uh, this is the ascending aorta. I think you can see the calcific atherosclerosis here. And here's a penetrating ulcer along the anterior wall of the ascending aorta. We took a, a percutaneous approach. We cut down on the left subclavian. You can see our sheath here. And here's our stent graft. And we just deployed that and embolized the ulcer there. And this is the three-month post-op. You can see obliteration of the pseudoaneurysm. Next, uh, traumatic aortic rupture. Uh, we don't see a lot of these because we're not a major uh, trauma center. We are uh, seeking, I think, level three, so we may see this. It typically is a rapid deceleration energy, uh, deceleration injury, uh, 4G plus energy transmitted to the sternum. Second leading cause of motor vehicle deaths, 80% die in the field, 20% make it to the emergency room alive. The tip off is a wide mediastinum on chest X-ray and you need a CT angio to establish the diagnosis. And again, the forces are sternum against the uh, steering wheel or some type of impediment. Here's the ascending and arch, which is not fixed. The descending is. So the force is forward movement of the ascending and arch. The descending remains fixed and the tear occurs right here near the ligamentum arteriosum or the former uh, ductus. Here's the typical CT. I think you can see a big hematoma. Here's the tear in the proximal descending thoracic aorta. In the old days, it was uh, brutal. You had to do open repairs before the stent grafts were available. Keep in mind, if you have 4G injury, you're going to have pretty significant CNS event. So high risk for heparinization and potential bypass to fix open repair of descending thoracic aorta. So for that reason, Stent graft repair is the state of the art. So almost all are fixed with stent grafts in the modern era. So it's really revolutionized the treatment of a potentially deadly uh, disease. And here's the typical repair. Here's the tear junction of the proximal descending in the aorta here near the ligamentum arteriosum and stent graft driven up through the groin is a very effective way to take care of business. Coarctation, uh, also relatively uh, uncommon, four out of 10,000 live births. Getting into adult with a coarct is pretty unusual. It's more common in males and females. You can see the presentation, hypertension, lower, diminished lower extremity pulses, headache, heart failure, claudication. Uh, in 83% of adults, they have an additional CV anomaly and that includes bicuspid aortic valve, arch hypoplasia, ventricular septal defect, or patent ductus arteriosus. 
And in the old days, uh, it was typically open repair in childhood, as depicted here in the upper panels. It was either direct re resection and uh, end to end anastomosis or a subclavian flap. And that's been supplanted, particularly in adults, with a balloon angioplasty and stent graft or stent placement in the bottom panel there. We had an interesting case, a 41-year-old female. She had poorly controlled hypertension, which was her coarctation in disguise. She was actually being worked up for a cholecystectomy and had pretty loud uh, murmur across the chest and supraclavicular area. Echo showed moderate AI and dilated aortic root. She actually ended up uh, having a bicuspid aortic valve. And you can see her dilated ascending aorta here. Here's the left ventricle. And this is her coarctation here. So this is her arch coming down, huge left subclavian artery. I think you can see her collaterals, which are the intercostal arteries here underneath the ribs. And here's her pinpoint uh, coarctation here. See that little pinpoint? It was difficult to get a wire through there. So we took a little different approach. She was having her ascending repaired. Uh, so she was going on bypass. <clears throat> so we did median sternotomy. Uh, we did distal ascending aortic cannulation repaired the aortic valve with the aneoplasty ring, repaired the ascending aorta with the graft here. We left a side graft on, and through that, we delivered a stent graft uh, while through the median sternotomy and stented this area of coarctation. And here's her after picture here. I think you can see a reasonable result. So this is her subclavian artery. It's already shrunken in size compared to three months previously, and the stent graft here uh, fixing her coarctation. Shift again, abdominal uh, thoracic aortic aneurysm. It's uh, the most common, obviously, non emergent aortic disease. It's believed to be in 4 to 8% of males over age 50, 1 to 1.3% of females over 50. Thoracic aortic aneurysm is 10 times less common than a abdominal aortic aneurysm. The screening recommendations uh, everybody agrees on the following, and that is men age 65 to 75 who have consumed 100 cigarettes in their lifetime. Keep in mind that 90% of AAA patients have smoked. Enlargement rates increase 35% compared to non-smokers. Uh, other societies have kind of jumped in. SVS, the main vascular society around the world, says men age 65 with 75, 100 cigarettes, they agree with that. But they also include men or women age 65 to 75 with first degree uh, aneurysm relatives. There's been a 50% decline in uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture deaths in the last 30 years. That keeps a lot of us vascular surgeons in bed at night. Uh, and we believe that this is a result of increase in endovascular repair in elderly, uh, a screening program that's now in place across the country, even though there's low penetrance and declining uh, prevalence of smokers. And the most uh, heartening uh, graph, I think here, if you look at the number of cigarettes in the dash lines, from the 1950s on to 2010, and the number of aortic aneurysm deaths, which is the solid line, you can see it's almost a mirror image. So pretty clearly the decline in cigarette smoking has led to this decrease in rupture in our aneurysm patients. Physical exam's helpful, uh, not necessarily in our Southern Indiana patients who are more rotund, uh, but uh, uh, the skinny patients, quite easy to see these large aneurysms. Ultrasound, CT scan, MRI, MRA are all uh, possible uh, imaging modalities. Here's an example of ultrasound. Here's CT with this huge aneurysm infrarenally. Here's MRA. Typically, we find these on lumbar imaging for disc disease, but uh, still not a bad way to image the infrarenal aorta. Annual rupture risk, 5.5 uh, to 5.9 centimeters is 9%. 5.9 to 6.9, 10%, and greater than 7 centimeters is uh, 33%, and that kind of dictates our recommendations for repair. Um, there's been a number of prospective studies. The annual rupture risk is similar or lower than operative repair in all patients who have aneurysms less than 5.5 centimeters. So for males, um, indication for repair in the U.S. is 5.5 centimeters or greater in the infrarenal position, females 5 centimeter or greater, or 10 millimeter growth in an aneurysm that's 4 centimeters or larger. Any saccular aneurysm, which is depicted here compared to a fus fusiform, is an uh, indication for repair. And obviously, somebody who's symptomatic, that is leak or rupture, needs to be repaired emergently. So here's the dark side of aneurysm repair in the US, and I'll compare it to the UK. First of all, about 40, we're 
we have a pretty good database. About 40% of our aneurysm repairs in the U.S. actually have a diameter less than 5.5 centimeters. So that really means that there's a number of aneurysms being done across the country who really don't need to be repaired. It should probably stay in the fold of uh, conservative management and follow-up imaging with ultrasound or CT. <clears throat> the other is, and this is even more disheartening, is EVAR, that's endovascular repair, rupture rates have been masked. And there was this huge tiff um, that I'll go over in just a second between Medtronic and uh, the SVS with regards to the publication. And uh, what happened is they had a, a significant, not, not high, but a significant rupture risk in their patients who had Medtronic device placed for endograft. And it was about two and a half percent. And they were really upset and didn't want to have this published, even though it was kind of common knowledge. So they actually blocked, they talked to the FDA and blocked the publication of this paper showing a little bit higher rupture rate than they wanted in their post-EVAR patients. The other uh, thing, which is also uh, disheartening, is about 58.5% of the time, the instructions for use for the stink graph is not followed. And that, that means we're following we're putting stent grafts in patients who probably shouldn't have them. And that is they have, uh, we have fairly defined anatomy for who should get them and who shouldn't. And uh, we're breaching that uh, about, uh, you know, about almost two thirds of the time. It's overused in the elderly. And I'll just show you some of the data that supports probably conservative measures uh, in the elderly. And this is kind of a runaway train. It's big business. I mean, these stent grafts are not inexpensive. So it's a big money maker for all the device companies and everybody's trying to get in the game and own the majority of the business. So here's the um, withdrawal of the article. Uh, uh, and this was a, under objection of Medtronic through the FDA and it's in our a journal of vascular surgery, but essentially they weren't happy with the post EVAR rupture rates or post endograph rupture rates and they pulled the article. And I think everybody's familiar with the stink graft repairs, a guide wire, it's percutaneous for the most part in the groin. You can uh, drive the replacement graft up and then dock it with an additional limb from the other side. So it's a fairly a slick and easy, it just it really needs to be done for the appropriate anatomy. And this is compared to the open repair, here, uh, abdominal incision or flank, retroperitoneal incision, clamps, open the aneurysm, and hand sew the replacement graft, which is made out of Dacron or essentially a nylon material woven into a tube. So uh, for the most part, endovascular repairs, percutaneous, one hospital day, they stay overnight. It's almost like a heart cath, a little bigger hole, but essentially the same activity level post uh, intervention. Uh, here's the downside, it requires lifelong surveillance. So these have a leak rate, and I'll go into that in just a second, but these things can leak uh, and there's like a 1% to 2% chance of needing re-intervention per year once a stent graft is put in. So what that means is your patient with a stent graft needs to be imaged for the remainder of life at least yearly. And this can include either ultrasound or CT with contrast. Obviously, CT with contrast is going to be uh, radiation load and contrast toxicity. So there are plenty of studies that suggest that has a negative impact on the patient's uh, overall longevity and outcome. So the crazy thing, uh, leaks can occur. I'm going to describe this for you, but an endoleak is a term we use once a stent graft's been in place and there's leakage either around it or through other vessels. Um, occurs in 50 to 90% of patients, and they're higher rates when the instructions for use of their IFU is not followed. And again, we said 58.5% of the time IFU is not followed for stent grafts. So that means a lot of endoleaks. And I think you can see here, uh, compared open versus endovascular, all-cause mortality, a little higher in the endovascular aneurysm-related mortality, 4%, a little higher than the open too. So open is still a great way to fix an aneurysm. It's just a big hit up front for the patient. And again, uh, lifetime surveillance is mandated for the stent graft, CT with contrast, uh, ultrasound, 1% to 2% of patients are going to have an endoleak. And here are the different types. The most concerning is a leak around the graft at the attachment site, either up, above, or below type 1A or type 1B. Type 2 is back leading from the lumbar vessels that are normally present or the mesenteric vessel. Type 3 through the junction of the stent graft and type 4 through the graft itself from porosity. So again, in the U.S., 
about 70 to 80 percent of infrarenal aneurysms are repaired by endovascular technique. And probably it's safe to say about half of these probably are off IFU or instructions for use. And here's uh, the elderly. I just want to show this. This is the EVAR2 study, which is done in the UK. And we're comparing aneurysm-related mor mortality in the EVAR group, which is the dark blue, versus aneurysm-related mortality for no intervention group. And then all-cause mortality for EVAR in the red and all-cause mortality for no intervention group. So EVAR patients were elderly. They had a number of comorbidities. Probably the ones that we uh, kind of think about the most is about whether they're going to benefit from surgery or not. And essentially what the EVAR2 said is there's no real mortality benefit from endografts in the elderly with multiple comorbidities. So we really have to think twice about offering that to our elderly compromised patients. So the open repair is a two to four hour procedure. There's about 20% risk of transfusion, typically about a six day hospital stay, two to four week recovery at home. You need surveillance every five years, so it's not this yearly CT or ultrasound. There's virtually no end leak risk. And believe it or not, uh, open repair is much, much more profitable for the hospital compared to EVAR. Because most of the time, if you do anything additionally with EVAR, like stent or balloon or something, uh, the cost is washed out and actually the hospital loses money. So for that reason, uh, uh, UK is taking a different approach, and I'll mention that in a second. But Obviously, there's a huge financial incentive to repair from the uh, industry standpoint. Um, right now, 80% of our endografts are being, uh, our, our angels are being repaired with endografts. So our training, our producing fellows, uh, nothing against them, but they're very well versed in stent graft repair, but not as well versed in open repair. IFU, as we mentioned, oftentimes overlooked. Science is lacking in a number of aspects, and there's plenty of industry pressure to go around, even uh, manipulating the actual outcomes, mortality, et cetera. So just to give you an idea, across the pond in England, NICE is the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, and they recommend for infrarenal aneurysms open repair. And the only indication for EVAR or endovascular repair is if there's an abdominal copathology, high anesthetic ri risk, or uh, undue medical comorbidities. So in particular, a hostile abdomen, and this would include multiple abdominal surgeries with expected scar tissue, horseshoe kidney, which runs in front of the aorta, or a colostomy or soma, then you can consider EVAR. So across the sea, only 20% of patients are getting EVAR, 80% are getting open. So I think there's the right answer is somewhere in between, but I think there, there's a vast difference between uh, us and the UK. The thoracic aortic aneurysm, again, 10 times less common than infrarenal. For the most part, uh, you should strongly consider T-VAR, which is depicted over here on the right, which is thoracic endovascular repair versus open repair. Quite a bit of morbidity and mortality with open. Um, the, the other additional risk with a thoracic is spinal cord ischemia can occur in about 3% of patients. Uh, indications for repair, a little different from infrarenal aorta, it's six centimeter diameter, symptomatic, sacular or greater or again than 10 millimeters growth per year. Uh, I'm going to finish on uh, just a couple of things, aortitis and aortic occlusive disease. Uh, aortitis, we, we see actually a fair bit of this at this institution, uh, giant cell arteritis, tachyases arteritis, IgG4 related disease are the three most common types. And typically what we have is a patient that comes in with back pain or uh, chest pain and this is what we see on the CT scan, a thick rind and inflammatory tissue around the aorta. So that's the tip off. This has actually caused the renal vein thrombosis and you can see the inflammation around the left kidney here. So retroperitoneal fibrosis and more importantly, around the aorta. So giant cell arteritis is probably the most common. This angiogram over here to the right, if you ever hear or see of this, if the axillary artery is compromised, this is almost the diagnostic for giant cell arteritis. Um, it's associated with uh, polymyalgia rheumatica, visual change, mono or polyneuropathy, pulse, uh, pulse or blood pressure differences in the arms, and uh, chest pain. Uh, this is an easy way to identify elevated SED rate and CRP. It's very common, can help guide therapy. And this is in distinction to tachyases arteritis. GCA was 50 or greater in age. Tachyases is typically 25 to 30 years old, 75% female 
presentation is ischemic symptoms to the head because the carotids are involved, supracavicular or carotid brewery or blood pressure differential. Uh, SED rate uh, ER, ESR are typically normal and serology is normal. So that's the difficulty with following uh, treatment. It's usually typically great vessel origin disease involvement. And this is uh, the grading, not to overwhelm you, but this there's a classification system. And this is typically what we see. Here's an angiogram. This is the aortic arch down here. This is the anominate, the left common carotid and left subclavian. I think you can see all the collaterals here and uh, quite a bit of occlusive disease, particularly in the, the common carotid arteries bilaterally and the left subclavian artery. So instead of being out on the axillary, it's right at the takeoff of the great vessels from the arch. So that's almost uh, diagnostic for tachyases. The problem is it's difficult to follow the disease. You know, you have to go by symptoms and you have to do frequent imaging. PET scans come into play. We can uh, follow interleukin-6 or 18 in some patients, but uh, just no good way to do it. So you have to kind of roll the dice, get them on medical therapy, and just kind of follow along with CT or ultrasound to make sure that you're moving in the right direction. And the PET scan's gotten some play here lately. You can see some activity where the aortitis is going on. I think you can see in the middle and the panel to the right, uh, there's activity in the descending thoracic and abdominal aorta, which means you still have tachyases kind of flaming and probably need to step up uh, medical therapy. Retroperitoneal fibrosis is associated with IgG4, uh, plasma cytosis on biopsy, more common in the thoracic aorta than abdominal, uh, can be associated with pancreatitis, sclerosis, and cholangitis, salivary gland inflammation, and orbital inflammation. And again, classification, I typically see it in this location, the type 2B, which is the inframental aorta and iliac system. And here's a good example. Here's the iliac artery here, and I think you can see that inflammatory rind. This is the vein next to it, same on the left side. And here's the inframental aorta. You can see an inflammatory change around it. Here's a gal just came in uh, three months ago. She was 38, had interscapular pain. And uh, what looked like, uh, here's her initial CT scan. I think you can see some thickening around the aorta. And the question was, was this intramural hematoma or was this aortitis? Her inflammatory markers were elevated. Again, she was in her 30s. At the tip off here, I think if you can see, this is the subclavian artery and that left common. And here's uh, the anomaly up here. But look at the inflammatory range around her left common crowd artery. So that's almost diagnostic for uh, aortitis or equivalent. So we treat her as such. We in, uh, induced her with the high dose prednisone and added Imuran. And here's her scan six weeks later. Here's her left common carotid artery. I think you can see a vast difference between six weeks before marked reduction in inflammation. Look at her, inf her descending thoracic aorta, marked improvement in the inflammation in aortitis. So she did well after just six weeks. We tapered off her prednisone left her on Imuran, and she's doing quite well. <clears throat> Treatment of choice for aortitis, high-dose glucocorticoids, relapse rates, however, are 50% with glucocorticoids alone, a combination therapy, methotrexate, azathioprine, uh, Remicade, Celsep. And here's uh, one of my favorites, uh, much less side effects, tamoxifen, not sure exactly why it works or nobody knows, but tamoxifen actually uh, has been shown to be quite helpful with uh, aortitis and treatment of same. Finally, just to finish up, aortic iliac occlusive disease. Uh, not to belabor the point, here's a example. We we can we have great tools in our toolbox now. Here's inferenal occlusion at the renals, right iliac occlusion. You can see revascularization, and the new kit on the block uh, is lithotripsy. It's called shockwave. This is a balloon that you insufflate in the calcified vessel. It actually sonicates the plaque. There's a, a sonic a wave, and it actually breaks up and microfractures the plaque. And this area would be more responsive to balloon angioplasty. And this is uh, really a difficult lesion. You can see here, this is the popliteal artery. And you can see this calcific plaque that's eccentric. And this is both a, a shockwave uh, lithotripsy. So it's really helped uh, get through some difficult places. The aorta iliac is known for heavy calcification. And it's a godsend to kind of get through and restore flow. So that, that's it, the uh, perusal through the aortic disease. Be happy to answer any questions. Uh, feel free.
Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Webb? Or you can type type it in the chat too if you're in, if you need to. Well, I think people can know how to find you if they do have a question related to aortic disease. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Webb, for your presentation. Yeah. And thank you, everyone, for participating in this uh, uh, virtual Grand Rounds. Don't forget to do your evaluation. The <clears throat> I put the link in the chat, and it's also in your meeting invitation. Uh, we appreciate everyone uh, being here. And next month, we have a talk um, on um, with Dr. Daly on coronary CT. So look forward to seeing you then. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.